Uh, good afternoon. I'm G. Marie Caterina. We're here for the Ordinance Committee meeting. Uh, if we could take roll call, please. Oh, that's my job today. That's your isn't job it? today, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, Councillor Caterina? Here. Councillor Hamill? Here. Councillor Johnson? I'm here. Thank you. Um, approval of the minutes from October 17th, 2019. Uh, I would move that uh, for approval. You can second that. I second that. Even though you weren't here. Even though I had <laughs> um, All in favor? Uh, right now, um, is anybody here from the public who would like to comment on anything before? I don't see anybody. There was a gentleman sitting here, but I don't He's know. He's representing the um, 5G industry. That's what I, I thought. That's so. what I figured. The accordion file was dead giveaway. So anyway, all right, we'll close that for the moment. I can bring them back later, that's fine. Discussion, chapter 607, Town of Scarborough Alarm System Ordinance. And if Chief Thurlow wouldn't mind explaining what we've got going on here, it would be awesome. Thank you. Just as a matter of introduction, uh, this is an ordinance that uh, the fire inspector and the police chief and I have been working on it for some time now. Uh, we actually have two uh, alarm ordinances, Chapter 607 and 607A. So this process that we're, we've undertaken is, um, first and foremost, to combine those two into one ordinance instead of having two separate ones. And then the real uh, reason for the changes is because as part of the new public safety building, one of the early decisions that we had to make is whether we were going to continue to maintain our municipal fire alarm system, the old, what we call a legacy system. And just for your edification and, and the public's, um, this is a, a system that's based on 100-year-old telegraph technology. We actually have copper cables in a large section of the town. It runs on a, we call it a 100 milliamp circuit. It's a battery-powered DC voltage system and all of our municipal buildings, uh, a number of different public buildings and, and other private businesses that happen to be on the um, corridors where we have this coverage have been allowed to connect and, and uh, be monitored directly by the Public Safety Communications Bureaus for a number of years. The system has been in place for, oh my goodness, close to 50 years, I'd say. Um, it's a expensive system to maintain because it is copper wire and just corrosion on the poles and uh, when you have traffic accidents and um, just all the things that go with that, it does become an expensive system to control. It served the town's needs very well for years, but as part of the analysis when we were going through the public safety building uh, design process was the cost of moving the infrastructure from the current facility over here. And when we looked at those dollars and the fact that this really is a legacy old system uh, that requires upkeep going forward, we looked at options for modern technology and the system that we ended up going with is a radio-based wireless mesh system that does essentially the same thing, much cheaper, everything's electronic, and it still comes into dispatch. So it's the same, we're providing the same type of service, with a completely different technology. And at the end of the day, it was a fraction of the cost of moving what would have been an old system into a new building. So most of the uh, substantive changes uh, in the ordinance language that you've got to consider are really including the specific language for that new system. And we are uh, proposing, one of the things that, that my predecessor had always allowed was that Certainly we weren't charging town buildings. That, that's, it was a municipal system and it was primarily there to serve our needs. My predecessor um, never charged any of the folks from private businesses that came on. It was going by their door anyway. They made the investment in the um, parts that they needed to be able to connect and we have always monitored that at, at no cost. When we did go through this uh, revision, we have proposed some fees and we have proposed a, a permit uh, system and the idea is that there are costs in terms of annual software licensing and hardware service contracts for, for some of this and we felt that it was um, 
certainly we didn't want to compete with private businesses that are monitoring fire alarm systems, but we felt if we came in with a fee schedule that was, you know, in close to, but not necessarily as much as private business, but more or less covered the cost of our software mm -hmm. subscriptions and maintenance of the facility so that it wasn't costing the general taxpayer anything out of pocket. So I guess with that brief overview, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. I know there's a lot of changes there, and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Councillor Hamill. Thanks, Mike. I uh, appreciate the background and your work on this, bringing it forward, so, so thanks. Um, I'm just kind of curious, is there a transmitter or something? I mean, it's wireless, so where, where does the signal come from and, you know? Sure. So currently on, our, on the existing legacy system, you've seen those red cottage boxes mm -hmm. with the old pull yep. the white handle. And, so that's how we transmit now, and that's what actually sends the telegraph signal across the copper wires. What we're doing in, in our, our municipal building <coughs> is we're replacing that with a new electronic box that essentially does the same thing, but it's a radio transmitter. And each one of those throughout town make, builds on a, a mesh type system. So okay. the Blue Point School connects to the Pine Point Fire Station, okay. connects to Dunson Fire Station, and just keeps piggybacking back here so that we're always getting signals from at least three different locations so that if one should happen to fail or there'd be a bad signal, we're always confident that we've got signal strength from any one okay. uh, device. And then there's got to be some sort of, I mean, alarm systems have a way to send a signal? Is that Correct. So the, each one of these facilities has a fire alarm system yeah. and or a burglar alarm system already. That system that's in place, trans, it takes the signals from the various devices, sends it to what we call the master box now in the old system, now it just sends it to this new electronic I see. Um, transmitter okay. to do it via radio versus wires. Great, thank you. So Thanks. everybody can, the, the only cost is for them to change the transmitting piece yep. of their fire alarm system. I see. Great, thanks. Councilor Johnson. Yes, thanks, Chief Thurlow, for that. I actually had a call from a constituent that received a letter about uh, the new system, and I think the, probably the fees. So, did I hear you correctly? It said there wasn't any fees with the existing system for private business. That so what we it. what we have proposed is for we wouldn't be charging the municipal buildings right. just because it's our own stuff. But we are proposing uh, in the fee schedule a five hundred dollar per year annual monitoring right. fee for either fire or burglary. And then if a business chose to monitor both, both. fire and burglary, it would be a one-time $750 fee. And that's an annual both. fee? That would be an annual fee. But they're not uh, folks that are being monitored right now for fire or burglary the, on those, the old system. There if are they're no on fees. the old system, they have never paid any of those okay. annual subscription fees. That's correct. So what's the time frame in uh, changing over? So honestly, this is something that we've tried to get on the, the ordinance committee's agenda for months now. <laughs> Our original plan and the, those letters actually went out over a year ago with the goal of having this system up and running by the end of 20, uh, 2019 right. so that we had a three, four month period as we're getting ready for the transition. Our legacy system is still running. We've got right. all the municipal, uh, almost all of the municipal boxes converted. We've got a number of private folks in the process. And our hope is within the next month to be able to shut the legacy system down and make sure that we've got a solid connection to all of our stuff so that we will be ready for the transition. So this shouldn't impact the existing equipment that's installed in private it businesses? Would not, it would not impact Just a different way of transmitting? That's correct. And what we have told everybody is they don't have to, I say that, they don't have to come with us. They can choose to right. have a third party, private, yeah. at and there's all kinds of them out yeah. there. Right that will monitor it. Okay. I think they'll find that our fees are probably in line or a little bit less expensive than the private and industry. That's correct. Right. Um, that's okay. the, one, the one caveat to that is there is a section in here that does require, going forward, some specific high-target high hazard businesses that we're asking to connect, period. So okay. they can choose to go private monitoring if they want to. Um, but it's things, and the list is here, it's 
um, places of, of assembly of over 300 people, educational facilities, Page which right. are all town buildings anyway. Right, right. So that we have taken, and this is kind of modeled after Portland and some of the other larger cities, and the reason for that is it's going direct to dispatch. So we know we're going to get these signals from all of our high right. hazard businesses immediately with no third party operators, no loss in translation right. between, you know, this is what's coming yep. in. and So that's why that right. is built into the when, when are the fees scheduled to be paid? I know they're annual. Are they year-end? Are they... Uh, count, we expect them to be a calendar year process. Calendar year. At time of billing? So the new people coming on that are going to pay the bill in January or February? Yes. It will be annual from that point in time? Yes. And what's the, time, what's the lag time that uh, folks need to either choose to do private or pay the fee to be We've connected. reached out to everybody that's on the current system, and we're in conversations with them now to try to get these decisions made as soon as possible. Okay. So we just don't want anybody to be uncovered. Yeah. Right. And okay. we can't, certainly once we move, we can't any longer run the legacy system. So right. there is a, a drop-dead date where we have to make the transition. We're trying to make sure we accommodate everybody's needs. But well, you'll be out of there in May, right? So Yeah, right. that's for sure, but right. we're trying to get it accomplished before right. then. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, if you've been One other question. So the fees, I was kind of curious, Chief, the fee schedule, are they, can you give us an idea of how much of the operation of the system the fees cover? Like, you know, they cover a certain percentage of the fees to run the system, or, you know, I'm kind of curious if you had so any idea. Th there really isn't any cost to running the system outside of the fact that, you know, it's our dispatches that are on duty sitting there anyway. And, it's not an additional cost because they're monitoring the existing system today. So it gives this, the new system gives us some um, enhancements such that right now, for instance, if the Blue Point School needs to be maintained, they, they're doing some work on the fire alarm system, I have to send somebody from the fire department over there to mechanically disconnect that box. Mm -hmm. With this new mm -hmm. electronic system, the dispatcher does it on a computer. Right, good. Yeah. It's yeah. just... Yeah. Everything's instantaneous. There's no more having to go out and do a lot of the field work that we used to have to do. Great, great, thanks. Thank um, quick question, just for the public to know, I have private alarm myself, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff and I, and we've got ADT, <coughs> and I was just figuring out how much we pay. And over a, a year, we pay seven hundred and sixteen dollars just to give people a comparison. Mm -hmm. And mine's, you know, fire and I don't know what it is. Yes, Jeff, but that's mm -hmm. okay. So, um, can private homeowners get in on this? They can. Okay. There is a cost to the initial purchase of the equipment to transmit. Okay. And um, actually, I don't think I brought those numbers with me. We we contracted when we bought the system. Mm -hmm. Part of the RFP was to um, be able to use our volume discount for the units we bought for the municipal facilities okay. and pass those savings along to private businesses. So all of the folks that were on the legacy system, we've extended that same offer and said, if you want to get in now and go to this new technology, it's just over $2,000, if I remember right, $2,100 in that range. Yeah. For the equipment. Um, for the one-time right. initial equipment to do the transmitting. And that could be private homes? And that can be private homes. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know for people. I just need to clarify because now I'm just a little confused. And not you, it's me. The existing <laughs> system in a private business, though, there is no need to change to this new equipment, this $2,100 new equipment. Not if they choose to have it private monitored. So if a, if a, if a business is on our legacy system, yes. whether they've got their own fire alarm, but yes. they're being monitored by us, if they want us to continue to do it, they do have to make a $2,000, 2100 initial okay. investment for that transmitter. Okay. If they choose not to have us do that, then they just have to hire a, a third party to do their right. monitoring for and how Their existing system will still continue to function just fine. And, and it, it, just out of curiosity, how difficult would that be to get a private system to monitor? Oh, it shouldn't be any you problem at all. It's just call them up. It's like switching from yeah. Cunningham D to whoever to whoever. Right. Okay. All right. The big difference then, it sounds like, well, at least in my mind, is people who aren't used to paying are going to have to pay a fee now. That is what we're proposing. 
once again, just enough to cover the sure. cost of operations. And I'm not I sure that I actually answered your question, Don. No, no, that, I, I, I got that part. Okay. Uh, but, I, but it did make me think of another question, if I might share Yeah, that. go ahead. So is there, do we expect additional functionality? You know, there are things you'll be able to do with this system that you're not able to do with the current system. Most of the additional functionality, I think I just explained in terms of being able to do the disconnects and, right. and the self-tests and a lot I of see. those things that are done with the software that runs the system. Um, there isn't necessarily anything new that we're going to get okay. transmitted to us. We're going to get the same types of signals yeah. that we used to get out of the old system, just in a better, faster, more technologically advanced stage. Do you have any other questions? You wouldn't happen to have a copy of a letter that went out to the existing users, would you? I don't with me, but I certainly can provide it. Could you? I just, because I think some people may be confused, yeah, and, I, and I could probably help them if I could actually yeah. read certainly. the letter. Great. Appreciate it. I'd be happy to Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Discussion between <coughs> us. So, I, I mean, this makes sense. I like the fact, Chief, the, the things you highlighted about, you know, the rationale for why there would be a fee. Uh, for the change, I think that makes sense, and you know, and the fact that it, there could be an offset to, you know, to things that uh, are, are required now in terms of service and repair and maintenance. So, I mean, it seems reasonable to me. You know, I think I agree with what, uh, the point that Ken made. Uh, you know, there are probably going to be questions about, you know, does this mean I have to pay for something that I, you know, didn't have to before? But they have an option. They have a private right. option, or in my case, not to connect at all. You know, so every time I burn toast, I don't have. <laughs> some truck showing up at my door. So, uh, but so I think you have some good options there, and yep. I uh, would appreciate the work that you've done on this, and uh, you know makes a lot of sense. So sorry for the delay in getting it on our agenda. No, no, no problem at all. It's been busy. We had nothing else to work. Ken, your thought? No, it sounds good. It sounds good. We're uh, we're moving into the twenty first century. <laughs> The thought of you know an officer having to go out to turn something off after an alarm went on just still I'm surprised they're not out there on a horse <laughs> not to do it. So good it's, move. Yep. It's served us well for years, but yep. it's time to retire it. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that also. If I could have a motion to move this to council, uh, I would make that motion to move this to council for review and approval. A second. All those in favor? All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Chief. Thanks, Mike. Next. <laughs> uh, <coughs> a discussion on Chapter 303, Town of Scarborough Personnel Ordinance. Mr. Gallagher. Afternoon. So the um, the proposed change uh, I attempted to uh, summarize in a memorandum for the committee's uh, review. Um, in brief, there are two proposed changes to the personnel ordinance, one to Section 302 with regard to uh, determining uh, hours worked for the purposes of overtime. Again, this would be a personnel ordinance that would apply to our non-bargaining uh, employees. And uh, a change to uh, Section 515, the retirement provision, <coughs> as it would pertain to um, retirees return to work uh, as determined by Maine Public Employees Retirement System. Um, so just a uh, high-level overview of, of the first change with, in Section 302. Uh, what we're proposing is to sub out um, uh, holiday time uh, and actually incorporate that into hours worked and remove compensatory time um, and when determining at the end of a pay period uh, what the hours worked are for overtime. So as it stands now, um, and I attempted to summarize with, through some examples. Uh, in a pay period in which a holiday falls, um, employees are, are obligated to uh, work essentially eight hours beyond their regular schedule before they trigger that time and a half multiplier for, for hours worked, um, which is particularly problematic uh, with holiday work weeks right. um, mm -hmm. because of just the way that falls. And, and so I think it's been a longstanding um, Grievance has certainly been something that's been inequitable across our employee groups as we look at our three collectively bargained groups They all incorporate uh, holiday time as hours work for the purposes of overtime mm -hmm. um, With regard to the the proposal to remove compensatory time again, I, I, I attempted to uh, provide an example of why 
that is problematic um, in, in this idea of what's uh, commonly referred to as pyramiding, this idea that right. for those who are uh, for the <clears throat> those who are unaware in the public sector, unlike the private sector, employees can opt to take time off in lieu of overtime pay. So they earn that time off at a one one point five hour rate. Uh, so you know you have a work week where they they earn eight hours of overtime. They take the compensatory time, which means they they earn essentially twelve hours of time mm -hmm. off. That next work week they take the Monday off, and they only have to use eight hours. If they have some additional hours worked later on that pay period, they're going to be able to compound that. And so that's a practice that uh, we're we're attempting to uh, <coughs> essentially remove from being a possible mm -hmm. a possible component. Um, so that's sort of in brief that first proposal. Mm -hmm. um, to give some background on, on this, the proposed change to Section 515, um, this is really uh, brought on by some main PERS rule changes mm -hmm. uh, that they underwent. They uh, just generally looking at the, the overall system, um, main, the main public employees retirement system really has three major plans. There's a teacher plan, there's a state plan, and then there's what they call a PLD plan, which is a participating local district, which applies to uh, municipal and county employees who, whose employers opt into it. And um, well, the state plan and the teacher plan has had, I think, some pretty, over the last decade or so, has had some uh, noteworthy challenges with funding. The PLD plan, which is something separate entirely, um, really is fairly well funded, but they did identify in the last three or four years a real uh, challenge with um, employees retiring from their position and going back to work. Um, and because of that, they were not then contributing members to the plan. And so it sort of had this double, they sort of characterized as a, a double negative impact in that not only have they retired, so now they're drawing a benefit from the system, but they're taking the sort of proverbial seat of someone who is now not going to contribute. And so to offset that, they came up with this rule change that essentially required employers to remit this UAL payment, this uh, unfunded actuarial payment. Um, or liability payment. Um, and that, that factor right now is at 5%. Um, the proposed change uh, that, that I'm recommending this committee to consider would essentially um, have the employer, the town, pay that payment up to 5%. However, that employee would lose their ability to participate in our 401A plan. So not only, obviously, by default, they can't contribute to the main state retirement plan, which is one of our two primary vehicles. The second primary vehicle is the 401A plan, which right now is a one-to-one, -one, it's a 6% it's a match. Six. So essentially, there would be a 1% um, you know, net change to the, the budget uh, with regard to that employee. Now, that UAL payment, I do have some question as to how long. You know, it's an aggregate, uh, aggregate value that's determined by the system. Um, I do have a call into the system. I haven't received information back that, you know, to really question what the likelihood is of that 5% increasing. Um, uh, but, you know, again, the way we structured this proposed change to the ordinance, we would cap our contribution at 5%. Therefore, if that, that ticked up over time to 6%, 7%, some variation thereof, the, the actual retiree would bear that responsibility to pay the difference. Um, you know, again, just expanding on, I guess, my rationale for this, um, you know, when I look at if there's such thing as a, a, a typical retiree, you know, our 401A plan has a vesting schedule. You know, how long are they looking to return to work? Um, so what's the likelihood that they want to enroll in a, you know, a defined contribution plan uh, with a vesting schedule? So maybe that's not a real uh, appealing uh, vehicle for them anyway, um, whereas that direct compensation, if they're really at their retirement age, is probably more significant. So rather than saddle them with that 5% contribution, further reducing their direct compensation, mm -hmm. I thought that that was probably a, 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 a trade-off that made some sense in the real world. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Mr. Hamill, Thank you. I know you have questions. Thank you. Uh, you know, this stuff is complicated, right? So we're dealing with retirement plans and also uh, anything related to take time off uh, is tricky. And I know the rules are different, private and public sector. Uh, and, you know, in terms of keeping track of time, timekeeping management systems, you know, if you look at all the services in HR, that's the one people are, you know, hate the most. Oh, yeah. They're never happy with it. So yeah. uh, this is no reflection on, sure, on sure. Liam or bringing this forward. But 
You may but, want to mention for the public that you used to work in HR. Yeah, I did. I spent <laughs> some time doing that, uh, and I'm now paying for my sins. So, uh, <laughs> but so, can you tell me what brought this issue forward? What brought a, prompted both of these issues? Yeah. So uh, certainly, the first issue was. Um, was actually something that I've found, you know, I've worked for three different municipalities at this point, and this is uh, unique in seeing holiday time be excluded for hours worked. Mm -hmm. um, unique you, as you, a town? As a town, yeah. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see, uh, you know, sick leave omitted. It's not, it's not uncommon to see compensatory time un, un, uh, omitted for, for the purposes of that overtime calculation. I've never seen holiday time not be included for hours work purposes. And mm -hmm. so um, it is a standing grievance, uh, you know, talking to our plow truck drivers. Um, yeah. You know, they go out, they have that Monday holiday. They go out, they're working from 4 to midnight on a Friday night, and that's all at straight time to them um, as it stands now. And I think that that, I, I guess my sort of um, philosophy on overtime is that if we're asking employees to work over and above their regular work schedule, so we're, we're burdening them with that inconvenience more often than not, um, then we should be remitting a premium rate. And as it stands now, that really just doesn't happen. It's outside their control. It's not like another elective, um, you know, <coughs> elective accrual where they take Monday off and the vacation or sick time, and then they have to, you know, work later on the week to make up for it or something. There's no control there. That holiday, we're saying, stay home. We're going to give you that day off, uh, uh, but then we're going to, in some senses, penalize you later on in the week. Yeah, I understand the discrepancy. The other thing I was going to ask is uh, related to that. Is there what's what's our policy in general in terms of comparing uh, equity issues? You know, pay equity issues, time off issues between bargaining unit and non-bargaining unit mm -hmm. staff. Yeah, so um, this is really, you know, looking at the, the three collective bargaining agreements we have, they incorporate everything. So vacation time, sick time, holiday time, compensatory time, all goes into hours worked. Um, I, I think that that's probably something that is worthy of discussion in the future as we discuss any items of, of pay and time off. Um, but it's just, it's really, it's just struck me as odd since I came here that um, this is the one, uh, you know, paid time off, you know, accrual type that's not included across all our groups and all those variations of time off. Holiday time is the one thing for non-bargaining that's not included. So it's, in terms of comparing, it's very, it's, it's right there. Um, you know, the only thing that as you look at the, the contracts, you won't see holiday time in the fire contract for hours worked, but that's simply because we don't actually recognize them as holiday time yeah. in the traditional sense. That holiday time is factored into their vacation time. Um, so if they get, you know, 12 days of vacation and 12 holidays, they essentially get 24 days of vacation, and that's mm -hmm. how it's represented. So this one's a very easy, Mm -hmm. uh, analysis to do. Uh, everyone has, every other group has everything, and the non bargaining group simply doesn't have holiday as it stands now. And how many people uh, that are non bargaining unit staff? Um, about, uh, let's see, right about 99. Okay. Yep. All right. Including department okay. heads. Great. Did you want to know numbers? Yeah, I was going to. Yeah. Thanks for prompting me on that, if, as long as we're going. <laughs> so, and I don't want, I don't want to jump to the retirement issue because mm -hmm. my guess is the background's a little different, but. You know, for at least for the paid time off thing, um, I think it would be helpful to know what the associated cost would be sure. if we were to make this change. Sure. So if you're able to kind of model that somehow, and I'd even I'd go as far as to say that I, I don't think that would be something we would have to see back in committee right. sometime between now and, you know. Before it goes to council. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, we all get grounded on that, and we say, here's the yeah. issue, and here's what it's going to cost. Yeah. Yeah. Also, then be interested in, in seeing if there's any on um, this is a two part request. Yeah. One is adding in the holiday time, right? But one is also removing compensatory time. And I think that there is potential for there to be because employees have the choice between choosing between right, yeah. time and a half or uh, right. further yeah. compensatory time. Yeah. I think that there would be a if there's a cost to including holiday time, yeah. there should be a cost savings to. Yeah, I put it all in there. I put it all yeah. in and net it out as a you know as a proposal, so we know what the overall impact would be. Uh, one thing I just interject: this is kind of crazy. <laughs> kind of, uh, we're just looking at this in terms. I know time off is really a thing. It's an important thing. It's really valuable in, from a lot of ways. It's a benefit that people 
value even more highly now. I know younger folks, it's a much more uh, important thing than it may have been in the past. So this is really, really very important. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing is, at least in the state of Maine, and, and, and as this really says, at least to private employers, <coughs> they're not required to provide compensatory time for right. for holidays or any pay for holidays for that That's matter. Correct. There's no requirement at all. There's no legal requirement. Right. It's the market so, that drives. Yeah, it. so it's kind of crazy, you know. And as a Something I read and I thought, well, that's right. So yeah, there's no legal again. obligation to provide any time <laughs> no. off. Yeah. <laughs> so. Or you have, so my daughters have both worked for you know large retailers yeah. on holidays, and no, there's no time. Right. Even worse, I think, for retail stuff, mm -hmm. really tough. So, sure. so um, you know, I think a nice job of setting this up, taking it up, and um, bless you. Yeah, Thank appreciate you. your fielding the questions. Yeah, well, and we'll work on that analysis. Um, I expect that you know this is obviously, you know, I'll be very upfront. I don't think it's it's neutral. I'd, I'd be surprised if it was neutral. Mm -hmm. um, right. But again, I think that this is really um, it just it's an issue that I think a lot of people have struggled with. I think yeah. that's a real morale yeah. kicker so, for their first step. So help us size, yeah, uh, you know, the price tag on it and the offsets yeah. accordingly would be sure. very helpful. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I yes. absolutely agree. Is okay. that the sort of, so depending on how the conversation goes with regard to the second change, is that the sort of thing that we would like to have come back to the February meeting ordinance, or is that something you'd be comfortable having be part of the council level discussion? I just wouldn't have to go to council, but that's The me. second one as well, that's the retirement one too? Well, let's talk one. about the second this one, one and then we can. Right, because right, that, yeah. that yeah. would determine if you guys can. Anything yeah. on this first? No, I do not. Okay, I don't either. You asked all the no, questions I, I would have asked. Nice job on that. And we didn't, we didn't have it. Nor, I mean, typically, we talk about stuff like this at a time. We haven't had a chance to do that. But, um, right. you know, I read the thing carefully. And um, Can you you know, I know Liam's very thorough with stuff like that. It this. was more a curiosity question. No, that's okay. Oh, only, you know, because when I retire, I, I am not coming back to work. So <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't I'm have that worried. option. Right, I guess it's a, it, it's a trend. Because a lot of folks that I do know that have retired from private sector are, if not going back to the same job, at least, you know, supplementing their retirement income, so. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, I think the reality is that um, it's very, very difficult to, to find uh, talent and, and fill right. positions right now, and, and I can't, you know, I think everyone's situation is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we can, lead, you know, read our, uh, you know, national periodicals that suggest that um, people who have retired have found that you know, retirement was great for a few years, right. but right. with all the downtime, they'd like to get back involved right. in something. And right. so, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, to be, you know, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll get right into it. You know, this really only impacts one employee right now. So in order to be this retiree return to work, it's not that you're receiving a benefit from, you know, another uh, defined uh, contribution plan or private sector pension. It's, it's that you are receiving a pension from Maine State Retirement in right. the PLD mm -hmm. plan. Right. So it's very specific. Um, and uh, they saw this as one sort of meaningful reform to help shore up that overall yeah. funding uh, of the plan. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that, again, we, I have to, uh, I guess I have to applaud Main State Retirement. You know, I know that I followed sort of a lot of these proposed rule changes as they went through the various committees and to the legislature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at one point they were really proposing some really pretty significant drastic changes mm -hmm. and, and parameters. And what they ultimately ended up with, with regard to the retiree return to work, is, a, is an incredibly flexible, especially by Maine State retirement standards, incredibly flexible benefit um, or, or provision of rule. Um, they really say, you know, the employer can do whatever they want to do with this. As long as we get our 5%, we don't care. You know, they, they, don't, um, they don't even say it has to be same for, for every, the same uh, rule for every retiree return to work. They're saying, you know, you can pay the 5% for Joe, and then for, for Sally, she can pay the 5%. We don't care as long as we get our 5%. Right, right. And so, um, you know, I think what we're proposing with this, with this ordinance change is to say, well, this is how we're going to treat this for, with regard to the retirees and the situation that worked for the town of Scarborough. So could you speak to that yeah. question of uh, uh, how common or uncommon is the practice? I mean, so you've highlighted this as a, another discrepancy or an opportunity for us to, to put these plans in, you know, in some alignment. So can you say, I mean, is this something all other towns are doing or we'd be on the cutting edge? Do you have any idea? So um, I know that uh, towns are, are trying to grapple with it and put rules. I'm sure there are some towns that are just going to say, we're going to handle this on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. and we're not going to memorialize a rule and, and an ordinance mm -hmm. or a policy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's not 
this 5% is a, is a main purge rule. So they're essentially yeah. saying that if you're in the PLD, if you're a PLD employer, you have to remit that 5%. We don't care how you do it. So in that sense, everyone uh, that's a PLD employer has to come up with or, or handle this as it comes up. So um, in terms of what other uh, municipalities are doing, I've, you know, I've, I've heard anecdotally some are saying we're going to split it with our retiree. You know, we'll pay 2 and a half, they'll pay 2 and a half, or whatever, mm -hmm. however that escalates. Um, you know, I, I think that the proposal here to essentially sh strip away, if you will, that eligibility to participate in the other primary retirement vehicle, I think, is uh, somewhat unique. But, so, yeah. So I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, yeah. but I did have a, uh, a couple questions. One sure. is, so is this a, does this match here, reply, you know, refer to go-forward earnings, or is it a going back to top up prior a prior liability so uh, there was there was one employee who we hired it, since this rule went into effect um, that we have adjusted accordingly so we essentially said we're going to take on that five percent contribution and we had to remit I mean the employee the position they're in is, is one of our lower paid positions um, and so that was a, a fairly nominal nominal cost, they also, just by virtue of their own decisions, didn't contribute to the 401A plan. Okay. You know, so it's not like our mm -hmm. uh, employer contribution to the retirement went from 6% to 11%. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but out, outside of that, you know... But does it go to top up what they had previously when they come come to work here after retirement, or is it only go forward? It's just, a, it's, it has no impact on their retirement. It actually okay. has no benefit to the to the retiree. It's simply to make the. It's almost like a penalty contribution to the system. I understand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. When you so they see no discernible. There's no benefit to the retiree or really the employer. Yeah. To to make that it's a penalty. But but this would be we think, would it be an incentive for someone to, you know, do people make decisions to continue working or not based upon something like this? Would you say? Um, I, I don't, again, I, my hope, my hope, my intention here is that, um, you know, if we have someone who is in a, in a retiree status with Main State Retirement and comes to a PLD employer and they're considering multiple PLD employers, the fact that we're going to take on this, this cost and, and not have it subtracted from the direct compensation will be attractive. Um, I also don't think that uh, a retiree is, is going to see us not making them or allowing them to contribute to a 401a plan as as a detraction from 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 that so i don't i think it will be um if anything i think it will be uh, more attractive to that retiree looking to come back to work right so it was this one issue that kind of flagged this as a as something to address or i i think like i mean i think the the, re the reason why i think we're bringing it forward is it's a question that we need to deal with yeah you know and and we we probably could continue to do it on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. uh but i think that you know anytime we can have the policy makers decide the policy of the town mm -hmm. and how we want to treat these issues that's mm -hmm. that's obviously the best practice mm -hmm. and again do we know how other towns are doing it or not i mean how we've uh, again I've, I've, uh, south portland has has gone through a few variations of theirs um yeah. <laughs> i haven't seen the last one okay. um and but i don't think it's a real widespread issue because yeah. it's again it's so narrow you're talking yeah. about someone who you know someone who's retired who's been eligible to retire is actively collecting a pension from another pld employer and decides that they want to come back to work and so with this rule just going to infect in, in you know the fall of 18 I'm not sure how many people mm -hmm. have sure. I'm not sure how 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 many municipalities have actually had to tackle the issue head-on so the only thing I'd say is that just to get here again you know the cost may be not a factor they may be nominal or not the issue but I think it would still be helpful for us to see you know make some sort of representation as the from the cost impact standpoint as we review you know, other post-employment right. benefits as a you know budget agenda item going forward uh, each year. So. And I think that the easy, well, I, I guess the, the, the reason why this was proposed this way is that, well, not every retiree would come in and enroll in our 401A plan right. at mm -hmm. 6%. Um, right. We're essentially saying that to the degree they, they do come back, we're saying that we're going to save 1% on that employee's cost with regard to retirement. Okay. It's going to be 1% savings. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Good. Thank you. 
Um, what would you guys like to do? I feel like we can move this to council with in the information from. Because I don't want it to hang. I know they. These guys have all been waiting patiently right. for us to mm -hmm. clear the decks yep. for some of this. Um, so want to make a motion? I just one quick question. Okay, sure. Please. 401A versus 401K, oh. is that just the... <laughs> yeah, so it's the IRS code uh, A for public employers, yeah. K for private employers, but okay. uh, it's all the same, really, for the most part, just all the same rules apply. Okay. Technically, it's not an ERISA-covered plan because right. public sector plans aren't covered by ERISA, but um, yes, it's everything you know about 401Ks would very much apply to 401A plans. So here's just one final question. Please. Is there any windfall elimination issue here with somebody collecting from a, you know... This is still another public um, public retirement plan they'd be participating in, right? So the they're program. not actually participating. By paying this, this UAL payment is actually not active participation. Mm -hmm. It's simply a penalty. Okay. Um, so uh, there's no, and actually inter as far as government windfall provisions go, um, PLD, well, so, our PLD participants are not subject to that yeah. because they actively participate in Social Security okay. for the duration of their employer employment. So uh, not every PLD employer does that. Uh, okay. Certainly on the school side, they do not contribute right. to Social Security, so there's that, that windfall right. provision. But right. um, that does not apply with this, this penalty okay. payment. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Can I have a motion adding in data? Yeah, I'd, I'd make a motion <laughs> that we put this in uh, front of the council. As presented, I still don't know how I'm, you know, how I would vote on it. To be perfectly honest, yeah. especially given the uh, the optional nature of it, and uh, you know, it seems to be sort of a de minimis issue mm -hmm. in terms of the cost of the thing or how often it occurs as an issue. So I, I haven't decided yet. I, I just need. Well, yeah, to I'm just question. trying to move it to council. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, all, <laughs> I'm all in favor of that. So, yeah. okay. uh, Councilor council. are we? Um, is it? It's. Is it the holiday for? Can we get a second? Oh, yes. Sorry. 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 Thank you. <laughs> My parliamentarian. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so now discussion. No. Uh, is it um, <laughs> is it the retirement provision, Councillor Hamill, or is it the um, com the sick leave for? Or uh, I'm sorry, the uh, holiday leave for compensatory leave that um, there's some question. Uh, about. I have less of a question now on the time off one than I do on this one. Okay. Okay. But that's for now. I still need more time to think about mm, it. Sure. And sure. Fair sink in, uh, okay. So I'm straight in my own mind okay. on it. But, uh, you know, the principles behind it of, you know, pay equity and kind of mm -hmm. treating people in a similar fashion on the time off one, I, you know, uh, th th that concept sort of applies to both of these, okay. you know, in my mind. So, okay. and, and it's a small thing. So yeah, I, okay. I think but an I, example, you know, okay. an example for the council, yeah, yeah. you know, Purely fictional, because sure. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Yeah, I anticipate some questions. I do yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I think we can. All right, can we take a vote on it? Yeah. All those in favor, moving it to council. Three zero. Great. Thank you. Thank you. A lot. Thank you. Next. <laughs> I feel like the assembly one. Mm. <laughs> Jay, if you, you guys could. did a great job clearing the decks, though. This is fantastic. <laughs> I'm well, I feel badly because I just know they've been like, oh, gee, when are you going to put yeah. these up? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, did you say he's bailing on you? Uh, can you believe it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have a discussion on the proposed small wireless facility licensing ordinance. Mr. Chase. Sure. Uh, let's see. So hopefully you've received my memo, mm -hmm. some background materials. As well as what I want to be sure we're clear on is a draft ordinance. I don't think it, it's certainly not ready. I know there's still some areas that need to be filled in, but I did want to get, we did want to get direction from the ordinance committee as we move forward. So, you know, just for benefit of uh, those who might be watching, and I know um, members have probably read the memo, but recently there's been some updates at the federal and state level, um, legislation and statute mm -hmm. around 5G or small um, small cell wireless um, within the right of way. In essence, um, there's now a requirement that there, um, that local municipalities have to allow for 5G to go within the right of way. And barring a community taking action, 
we sort of have no review authority. Um, it right. just, if someone submits an application within 90 days, they can sort of go forth. What the federal and state statutes have said is municipalities can ex exert some modest uh, local review um, with respect to really three different things. It's um, fees and aesthetics or placement within the right of way. Um, and then really dealing with the timing of getting uh, uh, applications um, uh, dealt with and, 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 um, and permits issued. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what staff's attempted to do is looking at uh, national models from the uh, National League of Cities and looking at what other communities have done. I will say I reached out to a number of other planners in Maine and, and others. Uh, this issue really hasn't popped up much in Maine. Uh, other planners were sort of caught off guard when I told them, well, you know, there's this thing that this can just happen if you don't do anything. They're like, oh, really? Yeah, I guess I need to think about it for town meeting. Mm -hmm. So this, this has gone a little bit under the radar. I was fortunate enough in the summer to be um, contacted by our IT, our new IT director, Don Bajan, sort of, you know, sort of put me onto it, said, hey, just an FYI, this thing's going on. Here's some stuff, you know, I've seen. And then uh, we've been contacted um, by um, Michael, uh, who's in the audience who represents AT&T. He reached out sometime in the fall, and I sort of said, yeah, we're figuring ourselves out here. And, okay. and, and Michael's been helpful, sent some information along, and uh, has been understanding of you know really waiting for the town to sort of come along and figure out what we're going to do. So all that said, what I've done, again, is prepared a draft memo, or I'm sorry, draft ordinance, and I'll just highlight a few things. Certainly, we can go through it and, and talk about all the details, um, but really aimed at addressing this sort of uh, shot clock provision around how long permitting can take. Um, one of the things I think we want to talk about is who's going to do the review in administration? Um, I've set forth in there sort of what I think at this point I've deemed sort of an administrative review team, and I know I didn't provide definitions, so. <laughs> The way right now, I, I sort of see this as an administrative review process being at the staff level, probably someone from uh, public works, from planning, from the police department to really take a look at where in the right way are these things going. And that, that idea was really spurned by the way we uh, deal with permitting for CMP polls. Oh, right. CMP, when they're putting new polls in, they have to come and actually get a permit through the clerk. And frankly, right now, our town engineer gets those, reviews them, talks to the different folks, and deals with them. So I thought maybe that's a way we could deal with these. But certainly, we can talk about what the right approach there is. Um, generally, what we're trying to do with this ordinance, and maybe I should have started with this, is really prevent interference of other elements within the right of way. You know, we have our sidewalks, we have drainage systems. Right. So where these things are getting located, that's really what we want to be sure we're, we're looking at. Um, and we do really, the ordinance is aimed at really trying to um, uh, incentivize and uh, seek to have co-locations. So put these on existing poles, whether that be an existing CMP pole or a street light or what have you, rather than a standalone uh, pole. Um, and then, as I said before, it sort of sets up a fee structure. I will say that fee structure is sort of stated as being it needs to be reasonable and, right. you know, um, but then the federal, I think it was, if I remember right, there's federal action or a federal court order that sort of established what reasonable is. And so those are the numbers that mm. I used. <laughs> yes, if the courts have already told us, then what the heck? We'll let them do the hard work. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, because technology is always changing, we have there's some abandonment langu language in there that, you know, if and when they stop mm -hmm. needing to have the facility in the right of way, then it should be removed from the right of way. Um, so that's just sort of my quick overview. As I said, I'm really happy to hear any comments, concerns, questions you have. I, you know, still think I, I know I have a bunch of work to do in refinement. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but I felt just getting be sure I was in the right direction with you all before I spent much more time on it would be good. And I will just say that, you know, 5G, you know, cell phones, I'm not an expert in them in any way. So I think we have questions on the technical side. I would sort of, I, 
don't know what Michael's experience is either, but I might um, see what. I want to talk to you. Anyway. <laughs> so, I have a question. Ahead, yeah, Ken. thanks for that. Uh, so, I'm assuming there are none in Scarborough now. That is correct. Yep. Could you educate me and give me maybe just a practical? Yeah, Michael, do you them? want to, You can join us if yeah. you'd like. I, I don't mind having an industry. Because the concept sounds here. fascinating. I. Why not? Michael, what's your last name? Uh, Dolan. Dolan, okay. Yes. Welcome. Welcome, thank and you. And you represent AT&T? Yes. You took over from Barry Hobbins? Uh, in a sense, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, so uh, as I met, you know, as Jay alluded to, uh, we've got about four or five sites that we'd like to locate in Scarborough. And I had approached Jay and uh, asked him what the procedure would be to get approvals for those. Uh, as you alluded to, the many cities and towns in Maine have not broached this issue yet. I've permitted several in uh, Old Orchard Beach. Um, I've got, um, I've already permitted a couple in Lewiston. Um, and now we're here in, in Scarborough. And, it, you know, we want to work with the cities and towns, of course. And uh, it sounded like you guys were on the, uh, the edge of putting together a, uh, a small cell ordinance. So we <coughs> kind of, um, sat back a little bit while that process played out. Uh, as Jay alluded to, there is a, uh, uh, an FCC declaratory ruling that uh, you know, kind of walks through uh, the parameters of how um, cities and towns can regulate these um, and uh, I just wanted to come up and uh, offer any uh, assistance I give I'm not a radio frequency engineer uh, I get more involved in uh, uh, the permitting side of things um, I don't know if you've seen one of these facilities but uh, um, I brought a couple of photos um, Let's see. And a practical purpose would help me too. You said you permitted some things already in, in Old Orchard Beach. Yes. So I'm assuming there's a there's a reason for that permit, a use for it's, that permit. Yeah. It just I'm grappling with. Yes. Yeah, so what happens? Five G okay. do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So all right. So and I'm so, an IT guy. I should know that. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Been busy with the council lately. I don't know. <laughs> so ours aren't five G yet. Uh, they, these antennas are known as small cell facilities. Yep. What happens yep. is uh, my client, AT&T, uh, operates a wireless network, and in certain areas, their macro antenna facilities, which are the big right. antennas on the big towers and water tanks, uh, those aren't covering a certain area uh, in a way that allows for optimal uh, capacity uh, and data transmission, so there'll be these targeted little areas that are overloaded. Okay. And okay. what the companies can do now is come in with one of these small cell facilities, which is a small antenna placed on the top of most usually a, uh, uh, a utility pole with an equipment cabinet on the side, and mm -hmm. that small cell antenna facility can provide a a little boost to that yeah, area. Like so as you can imagine, there are certain areas in Old Orchard Beach down by the water. Right. Um, it's it typically yep. is a, in a concentrated area, but not always. It yep. can be an area where, you know, two kind of uh, an antenna coverage from here and there may overlap in a way that there's a little bit of a problem here. Like and instead of putting in a big, huge antenna, right. they can come in with a small one. Right. Um, What's the average coverage on that? I'm you know, it's it's between uh, a tenth of a mile and a quarter of a mile. Oh, yeah. That's it's that small. small. So yeah. it's almost neighborhood type yeah. thing for the internet of everything, right? Yep. My refrigerator wants to call Hannaford to go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Right. So it's more for a dense population as opposed to where Scarborough, we've got, I live on the rural part of Scarborough. Right. Um, and I'm an AT&T customer. That's yeah, why I want to talk to you. And it, 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 it anyway. does, <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, dense uh, residences, okay. if you will. It can be commercial. It can be right. users, yeah. I would say, as opposed to... Because they use them. I know... What was I reading? I know just enough to be dangerous. And as some football stadiums or something, oh, yeah. they've got the 5G oh, yeah. to boost everyone's yeah, yeah. phone. Gillette whatever. Stadium. They're, right. they're in, oh, okay. down in Boston where we'll have... 
tons of them there. Yep. I mean, I've probably done uh, the permitting. Me and my partner have probably done uh, two, three hundred of these in Massachusetts, yeah. and you know, in Rhode Island, yeah. another fifty. And, and this is just the front end. Yep. Um, they're coming, uh, yep. and it's yep. good for the the towns to get some rules in place so that yeah. it's systematized in a way that works for you. Right. It works for the carriers and everyone can kind of, you know, we all want cell service and we want to be able to stream and do this and that, but we also want to do it in a smart way that isn't a visual, uh, you right. know, aesthetic problem. Yeah. So uh, there's a whole balancing act with that. And this is all controlled by federal and state law. And the reason I'm asking, let me tell you why I'm asking yeah. this question, this is for the audience, because we do have a number of people in Scarborough who are very concerned about cell. You know, they we had great pushback the last time we dealt with this, what, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's a contingency in town that's like... And of course, they're going after the health thing, which they know they can't okay. say that, but yep. they do. So I just want to be able to put it out there that right now, what we've got is in violation. Is that correct? It's not, or, so, it's or not it so much we're in violation. Okay. It's just an application could be, he could be submitting an application to me and tonight. And we don't have any way to control it. Any rules it. within that's 90 okay. days, they that's would be able to build That's what I want to get out. That's what I want to get out to the public. And this is really meant to allow us to have some sight. Really, it's about those. Right. Emerging co-location and really being clear about not having, um, we're working really hard on making ourselves a walkable community. Right. And so having yes. any technology being able to be put into our um, our sidewalks that we're putting into town and creating what are called pinch points, making yep. them less handicap accessible, making them less right. Right. passable. Right. We don't want that. So this is a way to make sure that we're partnering with the industry, exactly. making sure that we're being welcoming and right. encouraging of this new technology, but in such a way that our residents are not having their daily activity. Right. right. That's yeah, a great question. And collecting yeah, fees. So I will say, of course. I will you say there are many, yeah. there are many the cities and towns <laughs> that are not taking advantage of that, but. So with <laughs> utility poles was one method for, uh, for attachment. What, yeah. what if there are no utility poles? What are, what are the other options or variables for that? So occasionally and I've only done this a few times out of the hundreds we've done is we'll actually propose installing our own pole pole um, which would be look like a regular utility pole we've also had instances where a private property may have a light pole and we'll, ins we'll reinstall a new light pole that has this inside it we try to camouflage it that way um, so it's usually you know it, it wouldn't be the case per se that one of these uh, is going up on a building hmm. that would be more the traditional macro antenna facilities mm -hmm. this is the only ones i've seen so far are on either utility poles light poles or new installed utility light the, pole. the the length of the because i'm I, i'm visioning like a just an extension like a yeah so that's an example of what one can them around let me just yeah. see how many of these <laughs> well, he's doing that. I had a question. So, you're here from AT and T. My yeah. guess is other cell companies, Verizon and so forth, are going to be going through the same process or want to install their own. Who decides how many and where and how they go? So, our each company will have their own radio frequency engineers. No one's networks are the same. So, AT and T will have different needs than Verizon and what have you. Uh, based on customers, where other antennas are, and things like that. So our radio frequency engineers will determine where we need these. Um, and then we go to the utility company, and they tell us which poles we can use. As you can well imagine, there are many poles. They say, no, can't use that because there's this, that, and the other on it. So we're kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the utilities control where we go. We kind of give them an area we want to be. Can we keep these pictures? Uh, sure. Uh, we'll, uh, so that they kind of dictate where we go. But I think the question, well, my question would be, it's similar to cell towers where you share or rent from each other so, so another the, provider That's comes a good in. question. Oh, yeah. that is, co-location. Yeah, so what happens to, I have not seen one of these yet where there are two 
companies on the same pole because of loading issues and just uh, from a physical standpoint with existing wires on the pole typically what we're putting on goes above those on the top of the pole and then to put anything above that isn't practical from right. a technological so you don't share the frequency you would we don't share right. I have we are I'm unaware of any situations where we've shared a utility pole with another wireless company. No, I mean, actually, the frequency. I mean, I, I oh, had US cellular, right? We don't have our own towers. Everything is through AT&T or Verizon Yeah, so, something. yeah, each company has its own frequency. Okay, yeah. so they can. <coughs> Within a certain band. Yeah, yep. yep. oh, okay, thank you. I have a question that came up, but I will certainly, of course. Go ahead. Um, one person that came up when we were discussing this a few days ago, I think at the staff level, was how many of these could a community the size of Scarborough expect to have installed in the town for each carrier? So you can only look for Yeah, um, you know, I don't know what the future holds. I can tell you that right now, as I mentioned, we have uh, five that we'd like to um, install in Scarborough. Um, I can only imagine that at some point there will be requests for more. But the way I'm seeing things now is there's kind of a target list for each city and town. And then I suspect at some point there will be another wave behind that. But I don't see things getting really busy in one place before a lot of other places get done in that initial round. You know, I, I can't speak to exactly what they're going to do, but that would be my sense as to how it, uh, how it would play out. So as far as an actual number, uh, you know, I, I don't. I don't have a feel for um, whether that would the initial five could turn into ten, could turn into twenty. I, I don't know. I, one thing I did want to just make mention <coughs> is really what we're talking about is these type of facilities in the public right away. Right. I think um, Michael alluded earlier about maybe going on to private sites. Right. I can think of maybe the Hannaford parking lot right. or mm -hmm. Cabela's parking right. lot. Those we would sort of consider these telecommunication facilities, yes. which you know fit under a separate ordinance yes. in, in our permissible right. in another way. So I just want to be sure that yep. we're That's sort right. of talking about Thank this clear distinction that between that those two. Yep. Um, okay. That would be more of a traditional, we'd have to run through your zoning uh, right. ordinance as opposed yeah. to right. a separate license. That's right. yeah. So are there any other companies that have installed these in town yet? You've mentioned not, he's got five. Not that I'm aware yeah. of. Um, because you think the so. I'll, I'll, I'll say no. I see. I'm just looking you know, at the equipment, and I'm wondering if there. But are you near It could be that CMP. Or? Remember, C CMP sort of has their smart meters, yeah. which I think, because oh, I've seen those, right. and I've said, it, but I think those look those somewhat similar. Um, there could be one. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not aware of any. I would be surprised if any carriers put them in the right the, way without the only, asking. The only thing I will say is <laughs> yeah. I've yeah, gone into saying. some places where uh, a town will say, no, we don't have any. And in fact, some, <laughs> someone pulled just an engineering perm, uh, uh, an electrical permit or something like uh, that because a building inspector or someone said, oh, yeah, you're part of a utility. These are historical ones from two, three, yeah. four, five, six years ago. Okay. Um, but, you know, the way AT&T operates is we want to go through all the proper channels. So. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. So, Jay, what do you need from us at this point? Um, I so, as I said, I, I want to be sure, you know, as, as, um, as Larissa and I have talked about it, um, this is very much a draft. Is there anything in there you saw that staff is out of whack with? I, you know, I think I heard uh, uh, when Michael mentioned fees, I sort of, you know, assumed that it, based on where, where we've been oh, with we a number of fees. other things that we'd be <laughs> interested in exploring yes. fees. So I put that in there. So um, hopefully my assumption is right there. Um, you know, the fact that really we're trying to incentivize and require co-location over the fact of putting new poles. Again, I'm making some assumptions and seeing nodding heads, so I hope I'm getting it right. Um, what was the, oh, the other one that I really wanted your feedback on is the review process. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important one for us to talk about. At this point, uh, again, I, I sort of said it at the outset, but I'm in, I've envisioned, and I'm happy to take it any direction, quite frankly, but an administrative review process. Again, I think I've put together a team that probably puts the assistant planners um, at the sort of head of that, 
much like we do with planning board applications, and then we'd have the town engineer, probably dep someone from public works, police, fi uh, fire, sort of on this team to review them and do the licensing. We could do licensing through council. We could do licensing through board of appeals, through planning board. Um, my sense was, again, these are required by federal law anyway. Right. We're going to have very clear ordinances that say how they can happen. We already do um, uh, licensing for CMP polls administratively, right. so it seemed to right. me right. that that was, that's how I came to the conclusion that I came to. Um, so if I'm off base, let me know and we can, yeah, no, we no, can no. take a new course on that. Outside of that, I would say those are probably the big things. I want to be sure we're heading down the right direction. I think we're pretty close here and probably at the 10 yard line can hopefully push it through. Well, and now that we understand uh, what they are. Yep, and right. that's also <laughs> right. Um, so um, whether that, you know, yeah. you want me to dress this up and come back in yeah. February to, to the that's ordinance fine. committee and then we can talk about getting to council. Because yeah. um, I want to get it, obviously, I don't like things to languish yep. in ordinance forever, but I also don't want to have a lot of ordinance half not, baked not quite ready yeah. because then you run into issues well, like said, yep. I think now, now that we understand yes it, I think yeah yeah iteration. I'm glad you we were able to come yeah and, uh, yep. but I like your suggestions well it should be just an administrative thing too yeah and, and Jay, I have some yeah. practical thoughts. If you'd Absolutely. like me to offline, yep. you, know, we, we, you and I could set up a yeah. time. Yeah, that would be great. Just some mechanical things here That's, that yep. uh, I would. Yep. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I agree with all, all of those comments. The only thing I was going to say, though, is there any way for us to sort of work the issue right to left? I mean, we're dealing with a petitioner, someone who's seeking approval, but is there any way of, you had mentioned, uh, you know, engineering permits or whatever, mm -hmm. or, or you know, to, for other work. Is there any way that we would be able to work right from left to discover what's there already? You know, there is there are any. There. Yeah. I could, I can put some feelers out. See I'd what, be curious. Right. I just because uh, you know, and, and not not so much from the standpoint of going back and retroactively trying to charge fees or anything like that, but this stuff is happening so quickly, uh, and you, you've just heard that it's going to be multiple carriers are going to be doing oh, this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's it's absolutely appropriate to have it run through, you know, our, our technical groups, you know, our, our ordinance and zoning uh, boards, uh, our planning and, and zoning boards, rather than having stuff like this, you know, come to the council. I think it's, it makes sense that it's working its way through committee, but yeah. but I am, you know, very comfortable redirecting directing it. But I'd be very curious if there's any way for us to say, uh, What's you know. out there now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. from our own permitting process or what people are seeing. So. Yep. I could certainly can certainly ask the. Uh, I'm sure that there's a few people in town who know exactly <laughs> what's out there, so I will ask that question. And I'm an AT&T, you know, uh, yeah. cell cell guy, so anything's going to improve my you know, connectivity. <laughs> and we'll John, be I just heard you say that you were interested in <coughs> going to go through um, our kind of resident advisory boards. I think Jay's proposal is that the permitting process would be done exclusively entirely administratively. Through our town engineer, public works staff, yeah. and police fire. Is that okay? I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I... So, can I have a motion to have Jake go home? Do his homework and come back. <laughs> come back. Yeah, so um, I, I to make a motion that we uh, request the town planner to go go back uh, and to try to uh, look at the current uh, extent of this and uh, uh, processes that are in place and then come back with some of the feedback, uh, changes to the ordinances proposed with some of the feedback he's received in a, uh, prior to us uh, going to the council to we'll see it one more time. John, can we shorten that motion? Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, I need a minder. How do you feel about this interpretation of this motion? Yeah. Uh, John Campbell moves to request the town planner to come back with modified ordinance for further ordinance committee review. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have someone assign. We have a second. <laughs> a second that. Like a All in favor? Sir. <laughs> Favor. <laughs> and that meeting some would be humor in this. February, February meeting. Yeah, yeah, let's bring yeah, it back for you. February. February twenty. Is that correct? Is third. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm on my phone <coughs> right here. My AT and T. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then that's correct. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Um. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, Jay, don't leave. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Please. I, I, the, I'm just going to take the liberty of adding one brief thing to the... Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, as you know, we got the charge from town council last night to start looking at growth permitting and the growth ordinance and whatever. What I would like to do, and I hope you guys are okay with this, is let's get Jay starting to do research yeah. on the last... How many... I would say go back to the last the Great Recession, which was 2008. Mm -hmm. To see what sort of what the growth permits have looked like since then, uh, or and that's e easily done. Um, one thing I was thinking about during that conversation last yeah. night, um, I know back in June we did a presentation that actually had a lot of that data, and I know mm -hmm. often you know, growth management is right. dense and hard. Yes, and you've seen it once that sort of refreshing that and bringing that back forward. I think the more yeah. people can see it, you, yes. you learn right. It gets a little deeper yes. with each time. So. Um, I'm happy to please to do that. Okay. I'll make it, yes. Could we perhaps have as the future agenda item Jay representing the, the growth ordinance presentation that was done prior with a refresh a little bit? Yeah, the data. sure. And then what would be really helpful, Jay and I spoke about this earlier, would be really great given the charge of council is if this, if during that February meeting, yeah. if you guys could be very clear about exactly what you would like to have yep. be researched and questions that you would yep. like to have answered so that our staff energy is really clearly yes. focused on, on yes. exactly what you're looking for. Yep. Um, but that if that could be the purpose of the agenda item yep. next time is to do that presentation and have you guys be brought up to speed on where we are currently. And then really, we are looking for direction from you. Yep. What aspects of this conversation do you want us to focus on first? That's okay. a great point. And I, and I have a, a follow-up on that because part of that similar to what I mentioned last night is because uh, our growth is contained in two ordinances. Mm -hmm. right? We have a growth ordinance and the zoning component that our growth refers to. Right. right. So zoning tells us where the use can... understand yeah. our growth ordinance, I would have to go from one ordinance to another ordinance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would get a little fuzzy and a little bit lost. So I would like to have just an overview of that so mm -hmm. as we're asked questions that can't answer off the cuff. You at least know how to research it. I would also be interested. I just refer people to Jay. <laughs> no, I have people ask me all the time, and I want to be able to answer you know, mm -hmm. truthfully and honestly. And, no, that's and fine. Hopefully, uh, you know, have their concerns. Uh, 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 and <coughs> this is kind of a general thing, and, and maybe this is a good time to correct me because I've read an awful lot of our ordinances, mm -hmm. and I can see up in the the introduction section or the, or the, the, the heading and the narrative and everything, when an ordinance has been amended. Mm -hmm. However, I cannot find the amended component of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So I'm also interested in, yeah, I mean, I'm I using a document, I, that's all I do is yeah. read documents. Yeah. So when I see an amended document, I can go down to the section of that document and find the amendment, what was amended. Cannot do that with our growth They're ordinance. In, or oh, ordinance. it's almost like I have to have two versions of the ordinance. Yeah, part of that is a um, it's a clean copy issue. So because the ordinances tend to be amended so frequently, correct. Um, but we I just get it. for your own, just so you know, we do have um, in our clerk planning file. Right. We Hard have copy. we have Hard all of the past versions, I believe. Right. So that it, it will be seen. So yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking yeah. because what I often do. When that issue comes up, I look at our zoning ordinance, and there's pages of amendments. If there's one that has a date, I go back to the council record, and the council record shows you what the change was. So, yeah, I. Which is on, it is what it is. Yep. It's up to me, it's a little unfortunate. Right. I'm used to versioning documents. I can go to any document and look a hundred versions back, real time. You know, so because sometimes I may say amended, but that right. amendment could be significant. Mm -hmm. And I just have a sense that's what's happened to our growth ordinance over time. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to be able to understand that. Would mm -hmm. you like us then to, as part of the presentation, um, have available for your, for in hard copy, kind of the, the progression of how that growth ordinance has changed over time? Would that be useful to Yeah, you? I don't know if it needs to be a hard copy, maybe in a narrative, really, okay. of what, the, what that uh, amendment was and okay. when did it take place. Okay. Hopefully there haven't been a... 
a couple hundred of them, like the zoning yeah, I ordinance. I don't think the growth management has been changed too much. I know. I was just yeah. thinking that a growth ordinance has as much as I can mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Like you said, I've done the same right. thing. Oh, wait a minute. What if I go back, back to that, to that date? date? Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. And yeah, we can see what we can pull together. You just can't get it done. Yep. Yeah. Or define the legislative history on that stuff. Yep. Overdo it, Jay. You understand the gist of it, right? Yep. The sourcing. Why? The yep. reason why. Right. All right. Barring anything else. Oh, Larissa, yes. Yeah, something else. Don't get too excited yet. Uh-oh. Um, so one of our residents that attended last night's meeting, um, <coughs> Crystal, she had been communicating with council back in 2018 regarding our fireworks ordinance, and she mm. brought it to my attention again last night to ask if um, if it was possible that, count, that you as an ordinance committee would be willing to consider um, adding language to prohibit the use of fireworks within 300 feet of a structure as part of the fireworks ordinance. And so just bringing it forward to you for your consideration. I, at this moment, I'm not willing to even think about that yet. We haven't told you why. Yeah, it's low on the list, really. I mean, I understand okay. your concerns, uh, but I agree. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah. Well, that, no, I know. My neighbor across the street. <laughs> I know I I'm not a fireworks fan, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's just, just it's one of those. We, it we just, should make a note of it so it yes. at least makes the make a notation sometime. to ask me in April. May I ask you in March, given the council schedule? Yes, okay. that's fine. Yeah, I mean I don't want to say just no, but. Uh, right now, we've got enough on our table that I yeah. don't need to reopen that at the moment. Not a burning issue for me. I thank Allison. I thank Allison for bringing it forward. All right. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? If we don't have anything else, so moved. All in favor? That's it. Call it a show. Thank you. Very efficient. <laughs> <laughs>